Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this morning on fertiliser calibration, looking at the practice. I'm really delighted to have with me here today Ian Foreman, Trevor Johnson, Nigel Simpson, and myself, Theresa Meadows, Knowledge Exchange Manager for HDB, that's going to take us through this morning. You're in for a real practical workshop this morning, looking at fertiliser calibration, looking at product testing, te tray testing, and spreader inspection. And I hope you get a lot out of this workshop that we're going to have today. So this workshop has been designed in conjunction with Catchment Sensitive Farming and I'm really pleased to welcome Nigel Simpson, um, who we've put this workshop on together. If you'd like to introduce yourself, Nigel. Good morning. I work as the River Basin Coordinator for Catchment Sensitive Farming in what we call South Anglia, which is basically north of London from Essex to uh, Northamptonshire and up to Lincolnshire. Um, so hopefully we'll have a good session today, but it was thanks to um, Ian Richards last time as well for giving us the principles that we now want to follow up with the practice. Brilliant, thank you Nigel. And it's great to be working with Catchment Sensitive Farming for this on, on the themes and topics that are relevant um, to all of us um, as we go through today. So if you missed um, our first session, part one, on the principles with Ian Richards, as Nigel's just said, um, it is still available to watch back the recordings on our AHDB Series North Seeds YouTube channel, and you can get the slides and other resources from the link that's on that page. So um, if we just go on to some housekeeping today, um, sadly, we can't see you or hear you this morning, um, but it's great to know that you're there and um, many of you joining us um, this morning. You're all on mute, um, but be, please do feel free to kind of be in touch and ask us questions and engage as we go through. I've put a little box and um, what you should be able to see on the little panel um, beside you, if you click on that orange arrow that's there, you can see the questions box. It's that box if you type in below and press and um, myself and my colleague Christian will be able to see. When I say about basis and neuroso points in a minute, that's the place to put your basis and neuroso points and that's the place to ask any questions as we go through today. We're scheduled to be here till half past 10 today um, and we'll make sure that there's plenty of time for questions after Trevor and Ian's presentation. The session is being recorded today and you'll get an automated email from GoToWebinar with the recording um, in tomorrow morning so you can watch this back if you missed any of it. Equally it will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website um, by the end of the week. If you claim basis and neuroso points, um, there are two basis and one neuroso point attached to this um, webinar. If in that questions box I've just highlighted, you can put your name, your basis account number and your postcode to claim your basis points and your name, your neuroso membership number, your date of birth and your postcode if you'd like to claim neuroso points. Also on that handout, you'll, uh, on the um, panel, the GoToWebinar panel, you'll see there's a section called Handouts. We have put a, a few in there that might be relevant for you today. The Farming Rules for Water that Ian will mention later. Um, some fertiliser um, considerations in terms of health and safety and the offers that are available through Catchment Sensitive Farming. So they're available for you to download any point through the webinar today as well. So the format of our session today is we're shortly going to hand over to Ian Foreman, who's NSTS manager um, nationally running the National Spreader Testing and Sprayer Testing Scheme, and to Trevor Johnson of Acare Services Limited. And Trevor um, runs NSTS tests for sprayers and spreaders um, with Acare, mainly based in Norfolk, um, but venturing out to other places as well, um, East Anglia. But for today is very much a national webinar and welcome to those of you that are around the country um, and indeed internationally, we might have some international people out there, so welcome to you as well. So Ian and Trevor are going to take us through the principles um, of testing your spreader, of calibrating your, um, your spreader and looking at products and then we've got time for questions and discussion from then and we'll make sure we finish um, for 10.30. So just to kind of get you going this morning um, and to kind of see um, who we've got out there, we've got a couple of polls. Um, so if we just launch the first one, so if you click on your screen, um, if you click on your screen, you'll be able to select one of these. And we were just interested for Trevor and for 
um, Ian's benefit and for Nigel and I just to see who we've got out there and joining us today and whether you're an agronomist or you're an advisor um, you're an operator um, kind of focusing mainly on fertilizer spreading um, or you're a farmer and, and you do a bit of everything I'm sure uh, so we've got 80% of you are well wide awake and raring to go this morning so if you'd like to just display the results Christian we'll see who we've got so mainly farmers on the line, um, but a good balance as well of those of you that are operators, um, agronomists and advisors there as well. So welcome to you all this morning and I know today um, will be really interesting for all of you. So the next question is, um, those of you that have got fertiliser spreaders at home, have you had your spreader tested in the last year? Um, yes, you've tray tested it, or no, you haven't um, had a chance to do that or not done that in the last year? So again, if you can um, vote on that, it would be quite interesting. Ian Richards in our last one had some stats about how often people test their spreaders. So it'll be interesting to use this as a measure of, of whether you've done it or not. So if you can display those results, Christian, that would be great. So yes, 46% um, of you have tray tested and 54% of you not in the last year. So um, a, good, a good number of you there. And I imagine you're ready and raring to go as and when we can travel, um, not particularly at the moment to go and um, put your fertilizer on. Um, so this is a very appropriate time, hopefully for you all that that will change to 100% tray tested um, before you go and apply that for this season. Brilliant. Right. Um, I don't know if there's comments there, Ian and Trevor, but I think you've got a great audience that are ready um, here to listen to you. And hopefully by the end, Nigel will um, change that to the other way around in terms of the spread of testing. So I think without further ado, uh, we'll hand over to Ian and Trevor and they're going to take us through um, the, their slides for this morning and our technical information to today. So over to you, Ian and Trevor. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and thanks to AHDB and Catchment Sensitive Farming for inviting us today. As Teresa said, my name is Ian Foreman, the NSTS manager, and with me is Trevor Johnson of Acare Services Limited, who are sprayer specialists based in North Norfolk, who, as well as testing sprayers, also test fertilizer spreaders. What we will be talking about this morning is putting into practice a lot of the things that Ian Richards talked about at the first meeting in December on the principles of calibration. And again, as Teresa mentioned about one of the slides that Ian had of how many farmers are having their spreaders tested, that it seems there's, there's still a similar amount of farmers out there around 46% today. And I think Ian mentioned 40 to 45%. So similar, but there is a slight increase there. Today, I'll start by giving some details about the spreader testing scheme and then look at the test itself. This covers four areas, the inspection of the spreader, carrying out a test of the product, the tray test, and finally, to look at the results and consider the outcome. If you have a look at the chart at the bottom here, we will be looking at achieving the best coefficient of variation, and I'll carry, I'll call that CV from now on of your spreader. So anything below 10%, which is normally achievable, is what we are after. At 10, 10 to 15%, this may still be an acceptable result, but anything over 15%, and certainly when we get to 20% and above, are going to start affecting the crop quite seriously. And I will talk about that in a bit more detail shortly. There are two main considerations why a spreader testing scheme is important and necessary, even though there is no legal requirement for spreaders to be tested. Firstly, for environmental reasons. The need to protect the environment and waterways is crucial, and we always also want to avoid any fertilizer being applied into hedgerows and field margins especially those with wildflower mixes, which require a low nutrient status to thrive. So I have mentioned headland spreading here as well, and I would encourage anyone who has had, who is having their spreader tested to have it checked on headland spreading mode as well. 
there are, of course, the environmental obligations that land managers to have to follow as well. No doubt many of you are in an NVZ and have to follow those rules. And now there are the requirements stated in the farming rules for water, which were introduced in 2018. And here you can say one of the statements is that you must take reasonable precautions to reduce the risk of pollution when you apply manure or fertilizer. There are also cross compliance considerations, namely GAEC 1 of no spreading within two meters of a waterway or center of a hedge, and also SMR 1, which relates to NVZ guidelines. A final point I want to add uh, is the requirements as stated that you must meet all NVZ rules as well as, though, as, well as other cross compliance requirements to qualify for full payments from BPS and RDPE. Uh, and just going back to farming rules for water, if I didn't mention it, there is a copy available on the right hand side of your screen. Secondly, there are economical benefits of having your spreader tested. A uniform spread pattern across the full working width will help ensure the crop can fully utilize the products applied. The tray test will pick this up and it is important to stress that you consider testing all different products you plan to apply each year. The machine can then be adjusted to improve the spread pattern if necessary, giving you tailored recommendations for each. It is worth mentioning here that the cost of a test, which is likely to be in the region of £250 per machine, against the potential losses from uneven spreading, this cost could quickly be recouped. Grain quality, increased risk of lodging and dry matter in grass will all be affected by uneven spreading. And you can guarantee that if you have striping in the crop, it will be in fields where all your neighbours will see. <coughs> Here is an example from the FACTS website, which is available to anyone who is FACTS qualified. And the graph shows the optimum rate of applied nitrogen fertilizer to a crop of winter wheat. Up to a CV of 10% is what we call a very good spread pattern. For, for a CV over 15%, the losses can be quite high. From the chart, you can see that if the spreader is applying unevenly, how much the yield may be reduced by, and you could also be wasting fertilizer as the crop cannot use it, utilize it fully. Just a reminder here of the requirements for crop assurance purposes that fertilizers must be applied in a way to avoid the risk of contamination and pollution. And at the bottom, that the spreader must be checked to ensure accurate application and states the machine must be calibrated every year. Of course, many spreaders, such as those fitted with whey cells, and const are constantly calibrating. The NSTS test takes this one step further by knowing where the fertilizer is going when it hits the ground. There are currently 29 test centers across the UK offering fertilizer spreader testing, and the red dots show the locations of the 63 qualified examiners. If you are considering having your spreader tested, go to the NSTS website or give me a call for further information. You can also see from the map that there may be opportunities for anyone who might be interest in, interested in setting up as a test centre. Because there was no international standard for fertiliser spreader testing available, one was developed by the Agricultural Engineers Association, along with spreader manufacturers and other industry experts. And the standard covers all types of spreading equipment. Examiners are qualified to level three city and guilds, and there are two training centers available, both offering a two day course followed by the assessment. And again, if anyone is interested in testing spreaders, please get in touch. We will now look at the spreader test itself 
starting with an inspection of the machine. And I will now hand over to Trevor. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you'll be able to understand my Norfolk accent as I attempt to take you through some of the practical NSTS items we look to cover on a spreader. In this case, it's on a KRM kindly provided by Stuart, a local farmer to us. Starting with the guards, as with all NSTS tests, uh, we need to check that they're all in place and all operational. We cannot proceed until all guards are intact and fit for purpose for obvious reasons. Next. Here we are ensuring the spreaders are securely attached to the tractor or the prime mover, checking things like three-point linkages, check chains, drawbar pins or demount fit fixings, etc. Connections of any hydraulic pipes and wires are also checked and positioned for safe operation of the spreader. Next. Agitators can be a common wear point and affects the flow of the product onto the disc. We carry out a thorough inspection, checking they are securely fixed and working correctly, along with any mechanisms and drives to the agitators. It is good operator practice when filling the hopper or washing down the machine to have a glance at the agitators now and again to check that they are okay. Next. A coon is attached to the grids above the agitators on this KRM spreader. They need to be in place to ensure uniform flow of the product to the agitators onto the disc and to avoid compaction of the product. At this point, we'll probably be checking the grids or screens for condition and fixings as well. Next. The shutters are checked for the condition and are working correctly. And the following video should show some of these in operation. Next. <clears throat> With safety in mind and clear instruction to the operator, we can check that booth shutters are working correctly as seen here. The required, the required rate and calibration relies on the correct operation and setup and condition of these shutters. Depending on type and manufacture of the machine, additional checks may be required when checking the settings of some shutters. Many common problems are due to corrosion. Mineral fertilizer is extreme, extremely corrosive, often with a high content of nitrogen, nitrogen and sulfur, which combined with water generates sulfuric acid. Remember, always to coat the entire spreader in a corrosion protective oil. It's not sufficient just to wash a spreader, as dried in fertilizer dust will absorb water and escalate the corrosion. Always refer to your machine's operator manual for cleaning and maintenance advice. We also need to consider our personal safety and use of PPE when handling fertilizer. As we know, dry fertilizer is hydroscopic, meaning it attracts moisture. It can draw water out of, the, out of your skin and leave it red and sore, causing skin burns. On the right hand side of your screen, I think there is a, another download which may be of assistance to you regarding precautions to take when handling fertilizer. Next. Headling spreading. Headlands can make up a large proportion of the field. To spread evening, evenly to the field edge, the spreader pattern on the edge side must be radically altered from the normal wide overlapping pattern to an abrupt none overlap box shape pattern at the field edge. The edge pattern can also be adjusted to avoid any fertilizer passing the boundary if there's a water course nearby or alternatively to maximize yield to the field edge. The key to setting the headland components correctly is really to consult the manufacturer's resources, whether it be uh, online or in the instructional manuals. It is always advisable to check this by doing a tray test. Headland operation is straightforward with this KRM, that's the top left hand picture, as you just reverse the rotation of the disc. Other examples of border headland spreading mechanisms are shown and checks will be made to ensure they are not damaged, adjustable and working correctly either manually or via GPS systems. Next. Having checked the machine has been thoroughly cleaned inside and out with no signs of fertilizer and dust, 
the discs are checked for rotation, free movement, bearings, damage, and connection to the drive mechanisms. The vines are checked for mounting and security to the disc. They are intact, not deformed, or have any wearing holes or ripples. We will also look for any other issues that may affect the pattern, such as rusty surfaces and vine wear protective coatings. In this case, I'm checking both front and back of vines, as both sides are used, front for normal spreading and rear for headling spreading. If fit, we check condition and position of the disc brushes. These help the product positioning and shielding from the wind or vacuum caused by the rotation of the disc, which may affect the crank movement and propulsion of the product. We check any accessible drive shafts, gearboxes, etc., for wear or misalignment and damage. We also check any guards or profiles fitted that aids the correct distribution of the product. These and other checks will vary depending on the equipment and manufacturer that's produced for us on the day. We do expect the competent operator to be present on the day of the test, along with the product to be tri tested. Next. On some occasions, with a visual check, it might not be viable to go ahead with a tri test if obvious faults are found that will affect the results. This is an example of a badly worn vine. Regular checking is recommended if more abrasive products are used during the season for things like this. Next. Spreaders can be powered via the PTU drive or the hydraulics from the tractor or prime mover. This will determine if the RPM test is done on the PTO or on the discs. We will cover both on the next slides. Next. Here we have set the tractor PTO to run at 500 RPM in the, inside the tractor on the uh, computer. We now need to check that the PTO speed reading in the cab matches the actual speed of the PTO itself. Next. Having removed the PTO drive shaft and the spreader, we can now check the actual speed on the tractor's PTO shaft using the tachometer. Now you can see this is showing a 4% difference in speed to that that we had in the tractor. In some cases, the PTO drive may control the disc speeds through a fixed ratio gearbox. If disc speeds are not correct, this will probably affect the spread test results. Adjustments may be necessary at this stage to correct this. Next. Checking the disc speed is probably the riskiest part of the test. I've still got all my fingers and thumbs and I want to keep them. This is one way of keeping a safe distance from the spinning disc. The laser tachometer has measured 1412 RPM. We will need to half this as it's actually picking up two of the vines. So the actual disc speed is, will be 706 RPM. We can then refer to the operator's handbook or information on the app to adjust this as required, either by PTO speed or other means relevant to the equipment. Various other items are checked during a test, such as hopper cover, hopper cover and the covers, operation and safety decals are in place, manual adjustment levers for drop off points, aperture settings, etc. All of this depends on the machine that we're testing, obviously. Next. Here's just a little example of some of the test kit that we use. Some of you may be interested in acquiring some yourself. I've just put some rough guides down on there regarding prices, so you've got an idea on what you perhaps should or should not pay. Uh, as previously mentioned, the size and hardness of the product is important and can change from batch numbers and storage condi conditions. Maybe the minimum of owning a grader box and a hardness tester would assist you during the season. All of these items can be found on the internet from various companies and spreader manufacturers. And perhaps for another day, when it comes to technology, we are aware of the fast moving technology on spreaders with software advancement, ISOBUS systems, sectional controls, Various automatic adjustments made on the move now, which can take into account wind direction and speed, 
traveling up, down and across sloops, with information being received by many sensors all over the spreader, measuring things like torque, weight, speed, trajectory, etc. This is without even mentioning a satellite positioning input, variable rate applications according to prescription maps, or real-time sensing systems. I feel that yes, technology has its place, but it is only as good as the information it receives, along with the condition and operation of the components it controls. So regular manual and visual checks on the components and the mechanics of the machine can only but enhance the performance of this technology. So it's a short little section here. I hope this gives you a very brief insight on some parts of what we cover doing an NSTS spreader test as done by an old boy in Norfolk. So thank you very much for your time. Keep safe and back to you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Now to move on to testing the product being applied. On the day for this exercise, we had a bag of ammonium nitrate to test. The make or type is recorded on the on the test report and also importantly the batch number two. The same product as, Tre as Trevor has just mentioned can vary between batches or from different factories and product left over from last year and how it was stored and handled can lead to variations too. So it all is always important that along with testing different types of fertilizer, you may need to consider other potential changes within products. There are three tests we do on fertilizer. This is the hardener test, and we do this on 10 prills to get a relative sample and take an average. And with this product we use, we had a result of 1.7 kilos as an average over the 10 prills. Next, a grader box is used to see the size distribution or uniformity of the prills. A good quality product is one that has grains of an even size. One compartment of the box is filled with product, then shaken for a few moments. And you can see here about 90% and 10% in the middle two compartments with the outer two, the smallest and largest sizes, both empty. So this is a good uniform sample. A photo of this is taken and added to the test report. The third check is the hectolitre weight which was 968 grams. A small tip here for anyone wanting to calibrate scales is that a two pound coin weighs 12 grams. So what we have determined is the ballistic properties of the product itself, as we've checked the size, the uniformity, the hardness of the product, and also the weight which will then allow us to set up the machine accurately. Although there are a range of other factors during spreading that can influence spread pattern and width too, and need to be taken into consideration as well. And you can see at the bottom, there are a number of operational um, items that, that must be considered as also. Now we move on to setting up the spreader itself. Most fertilizer spreader manufacturers have developed apps which are free to download where you can find recommended settings for the products they have tested in their test halls. The apps will give the most up-to-date results from their ongoing testing and most companies will also give advice over the phone. So going into the Bockball app, this gives us three options for settings. 
by fertilizer type or analysis, which we will look at both in a moment. And there are also recommendations here for biofertilizers. So starting with fertilizer type, you can see the, there is a long list of the, the types that have been tested at the test hall and choose the product from the list. And from this gives us a chart for recommended settings. And you can see it recommends the correct PTO speed. And in this case, it's 500 RPM. You would need E8 vanes on settings one and two, and with an angle of plus two degrees. You can also see at the bottom how the product tested in the test hall. The results from the grader box and litre weight are very similar to what we tested, but the hardness of the prills tested at 1.9 kilos whereas our product was only 1.7 kilos, and this will certainly affect the ballistic property of the fertilizer. We also looked at choosing settings by analysis. So using this app from here, you're using the results of the product on the day. First of all, choosing the category, and then it asks you to enter the results from the grader box. We also need to enter the results of litre weight and hardness test and searching from that gives a search result within the app of the closest match to the product as you have tested it on the day. The next page on the app asks us what spreading width we want to use. The farmer who kindly loaned us the spreader runs on 36 metre tram lines, but this shows that we could only spread the product up to a maximum of 27 metres. This could mean you have to drive at narrower bout widths, although this may not be practical, but a conversation with your merchant is certainly likely at this stage. For the purpose of this demonstration today, we decided to use the settings by type as they were written down on the app. And now the last thing we need to do is check the machine is set at the correct height above the trays once the correct angle has been set. For this machine, you measure at the lower link pin, or it may be that you measure at the disc or the frame. So if you are unsure where to measure to, consult the operator's manual to confirm. Most manufacturers can supply test kits and trays and may suggest different tray layouts to what you see here. But NSTS trays layout are set at one meter intervals, placed on ground as level as possible and laid out across the full working width of spread. The operator drives through the centre tray, turning on the spreader in good time before he gets to the trays and allowing plenty of time before turning off because of how far the fertiliser is thrown behind the machine. Ideally, we want to be travelling with the wind direction behind to avoid any crosswind effect to the pattern. And there are also times when a, a test may have to be delayed because weather conditions are not suitable to get a representative result. But there is also some great te technology out there that can help mitigate some of the effects from the weather. Once we have driven through the trays, the product collected is then transferred to test tubes. The fertilizer is put into individual tubes up to the midpoint of spread, which is the halfway point between two tram lines. Then to mirror another pass in the field, 
the product is put into the corresponding tube working back towards the center line. The results are then transferred to the app and the CV is calculated automatically. A photo of the results is taken and maybe it's not very clear to see this in the in the test tubes here um, but by using the recommended setting settings on the app although we managed to get a spread pattern to 36 meters the result was very poor the machine examiner can now make adjustments to the spreader and do a second pass through the trays and record the results Here we have put in another scenario of what we would like to achieve on the day. And you can see a fairly level pattern across all tubes. And this gave us a result of 5.2%, so well below the 10% uh, which we are aiming for. And if we go back to the chart I showed earlier, and enter the results on the graph, you can see the financial impact inaccurate spreading has on, uh, on in this case. And with using what, what I hope is some figures of, for the price of nitrogen and, and maybe the crop of wheat at the time, the effect showed here is that there's a difference of 45 pounds a hectare. And again, if you were to have your spreader tested, that that cost could um, that cost could quickly be recouped. A full test report is sent by email, which contains all the information gained during the test, including the initial machine inspection that Trevor talked us through, product details and a graph of the tray test results, along with the recommended settings to use for each fertilizer tested. So to summarize, I wanted to consider all the factors that can impact accurate spreading. Today, from testing, we have looked at the product and tested the physical properties. We have also looked at the spreader itself by checking it over and carrying out the tray test. But there are all of the other considerations to take into account when going spreading. So take note of the weather conditions as certainly wind and humidity will have a great effect on, on spreading. Also, what are the field conditions like? Looking at the terrain, topography of the field, and again, combining those with, with weather conditions also. Depending on what technology you have fitted, be it way cells, section control, variable rate technology, or, or other components, make sure everything is set up correctly. And finally, but also one of the most important factors is the operator, ensuring he has had all the necessary training and is aware of the various influences each of these factors has on spreading to ensure accurate application and which will help safeguard the environment and save you money. And the take home message I would like to put over today is three points here really. Make sure your spreader is in good condition, that your tray test, that you tray test the different products to be applied each year, and which, but which can be difficult, try and ensure you go spreading in the best conditions possible. Thank you. And I will hand back to, Re to Teresa. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit uh, early on time, Teresa.
That's absolutely perfect. Thank you very much, Ian and Trevor. Um, yeah, lots of information there to talk us through. Um, great kind of practical run through of, of what you've done and what you've learned and what you saw and um, what you typically see in a normal situation. So thank you both very much. And um, we've got some good questions that have come in for you both. Um, and there's more now. And we've got to the end with the questions. So we'll run through those um, if that's OK uh, with you both. And welcome back, Nigel, um, as well. So um, we've got some questions on, on spreaders, we've got some questions on products, we've got some general questions that have come in um, already as well. So if, if we start on the um, spreader questions, and maybe one for you, Trevor, um, to start with, what um, does a brand new spreader need testing in its first year of use? Good. Well, as Ian uh, correctly mentioned earlier on, there's actually no legal requirement to actually have your spreader tested at the moment. You've just got your uh, 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 assurance schemes to meet on that one. I have found with any new equipment, whether it be spreaders, spryers or whatever, when they come out of the factory, you still need to actually calibrate them up and do a test to make certain everything's right. So the answer, my answer to that would be, I don't care what the age of it is, I think for peace of mind, you still need to do your own tests on it and set up. Just good practice um, to do that. Yeah, brilliant. OK, thank you, Trevor. Um, Ian, a question here about what's the most common fault um, that's found and what percentage of spreaders fail before they're adjusted? I don't know if you want to have a one. Trevor might have a feel for that as well. But would you have a, um, an answer for that one, Ian? From, from our records, the probably the two most common faults on spreaders one is the agitators are not working correctly and that's something that uh, Trevor mentioned about a thorough inspection of those and the second would be the condition of the veins uh, Trevor showed um, the rippling on the veins which can um, quickly become a serious problem and soon lead to wearing through the vein itself and uh, again as Trevor mentioned and regular checking of both of these items is very important. We see in the region between these two faults about 15 to 20 percent of spreaders fail on this item these two items and need rectifying. Okay brilliant and anything to add to that Trevor? Um, yeah I, I, I think one of the Biggest things that we find when we go out and actually uh, do a tray test for customers is what they think they're spreading to widthwise is different to what we actually find when we actually put the trays out. So they've probably got the machines calibrated up well, they're putting the right amount on over the right area, but not necessarily in the right place. So, uh, and we find this not only with spreaders, but with slug pellet applicators in particular, uh, it's a confirmation on the spread width that you're actually doing, which I think most people benefit from with a tray test. And if you haven't got trays at home, what would you say, you know, could somebody kind of buy a set of trays or test it in any other way if, you know, even if it's through the season just to check um, it is or? Oh. I've, I've seen people actually, because trays aren't the cheapest of things, they vary in price and quality that are, that are out there and available. Uh, I've actually seen people use uh, egg boxes before. Uh, there, are, there are other ways and other means of doing some means of checking yourself as cheaply as possible. But I think if I might be wrong, but most manufacturers, when you buy a new spreader, tend to supply you with maybe a half a dozen, ten trays or what whatever anyhow it's just on the nsts side because we have the trays closer together we perhaps get a better idea of a true cv of the uh, results at the end of the day is that do you agree with that Ian? yeah I, I would just like to add as well you mentioned about slug pellets trevor and going back to the first question of whether whether a fertilizer spreader needs testing if you are using your fertilizer spreader to apply slug pellets, it then becomes a pesticide, piece of pesticide application equipment and it would need testing to the legal requirements um, 
as laid out firstly in the sustainable use directive requirements and which are mirrored in the red tractor schemes as well or other um, assurance scheme requirements. Yeah, thanks Ian, that's an important point to know, isn't it? Definitely. Um, we've got a couple of questions come in for you, Trevor, about a recommendation for a good product to apply to the spreader to protect it after washing down, a bit of a protectant. Um, and if you're allowed to, to name any particular brands, I don't know if you've got ones that you tend to see work better or not. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll be practical about this. I know a lot of people to use, and I'm not recommending that, I'm just saying what I've seen. I've known people to use uh, waste oil uh, mixed with diesel, uh, WD-40s. I did say, though, refer to your manufacturer's handbook, and most of those will actually mention a particular product. So if you want to keep your warranty on the machines and uh, make certain you're not going to have any adverse effects for using the wrong product. I would suggest you go back to the manufacturer and they will give you the uh, correct uh, details on what to use. And to, to add another thought there, um, you can probably realise that waste oil can be quite messy. Uh, another option is to use a very light hydraulic oil and using a spray gun to go over the whole machine after it has been washed down. Good, thank you Ian, um, that's great. Andrew's um, just said about Amazon make a set of spread check mats for a lot less money than a set of trays and it's a bit more convenient he's found. Um, maybe not good enough for an official test but to kind of do, so yeah there's some good ideas um, out yep. there. Um, uh, so, um, just a question for you, um, when you mentioned about the City and Guilds course, Ian, um, somebody would like to know, just remind us what that course was called? For when? Um, it's a level three qualification, NSTF fertiliser spreader testing. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you. There's some interest out there um, for that one. Um, so a question from Rob about how much difference you see um, when you're testing the fertiliser product um, in a single product across batches or across deliveries. Um, I think that's quite an important question, um, you know, and something I'm sure Trevor you see. Um, Trevor, do you want to answer, answer that one first and then we'll come to you, Ian? I, yeah, on the day of that test that we went through, uh, if we'd have redone that test, I've got no doubts whatsoever. We'd have probably had a slightly different uh, results on the hardness of the product. Uh, we're trying to take a random batch at the end of the day. We just, just scoop a quantity out of the back of the hopper after the bag had been put in there. So we weren't taking it from the top of the bag or the bottom or the side of the bag. Uh, but it does depend and that can vary uh, really from the person who's doing it, the way they're perhaps holding the hardness tester, I would just say that if you're going to use a hardness tester, do make certain you've got a very hard surface that doesn't bend when you're doing it, because that will obviously upset the results as well. Uh, so yes, it can vary slightly from day to day, to be honest with you, with the situations that are, you know, you're confronted with. And we had a discussion before Trevor as well, didn't we, about kind of stacking um, bags and kind of transportation. I don't know if you just want to talk through that as well, because I think that's quite important and a practical. I mean, there, there's an awful lot of advice uh, online regarding storage of your fertilisers, regarding stacking heights, building, etc. But if you can imagine us coming out of the factory, us being bagged up, us being transported once to your farm, you're then reloading it again into the farm buildings. You're then moving it back out again. Uh, you don't know uh, really on sort of the dampness of the product. So I think the transport and storage side of it does have a big effect on uh, the results that you're going to come across on the at the time you actually start testing for the hardness and the size and uh, such like. So don't underestimate the importance of the way you store and handle that product. Yeah, and can I, I pick up on? Sorry, can I pick oh. up on one other thing? When uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, people asked about uh, the spreader, and Ian mentioned about the spreader having to have a test if that's a slug pellet applicator. Uh, just from a training side, 
there's no certification that I know of that you need to apply fertilizer. But if you're going to use that fertilizer spread for slug pellets, you probably then do need something like a PA4G. Yeah. No, that's good um, to be covered by all those things, isn't it? Depending on what you're putting through it. Um, yeah, no, that's important, Trevor. Anything to add um, on the last question, Ian, or are you happy with that? Uh, not really. I think Trevor would um, certainly have a better idea as he is um, one of the examiners testing the machine. I think I would just like to say when you look at the results that we had on the day of testing, that the product itself on the, the fertilizer spreader manufacturer's app showed a hardness result of 1.9. When we tested it, we had a hardness of 1.7 kilos. So I don't know when that fertilizer was tested at the spreader manufacturers, but you can see the differences between the time of, of that product maybe being produced and, and sent over for testing and when the farmer had his product delivered, the, the, the variation seen on the day. Yeah, and I think it's important, and that's the benefit of doing it on farm, you know, before you, you're putting fertiliser on, isn't it? So, um, and doing enough samples to get that right. Um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, the apps certainly give a very good idea or a good starting point of, um, what what the product is and give you the settings that you might want to start with um but for absolute confirmation a, a tray test is is extremely valuable yeah and those apps are all free to download aren't they ian and trevor you know you can yeah go onto the app store or the android equivalent and get them and um, it's good nigel a, a bit of a wider question for you i'm going to ask you this one give trevor and ian a break although i've got many many questions coming through trevor and ian so um <laughs> you're ready for some more and um, nigel what do you think about whether there should be an operator qualification for fertilizer application you know similar to a sprayer operator one i'll let you answer that one well <clears throat> there's no plan to do this at the moment but certainly i would believe everyone who's doing any spreading of fertilizer should do it in the most competent and professional way that they can so from my point of view anyone who does as it were get this training both today and or in future and agronomists are also going through facts testing that relates to fertilizer calibration and i hope you can have a conversation with your agronomist on this topic because at the end of the day the thing that matters isn't just the recommendations but also the timing and the way in which fertilizers applied and that will dictate the results as we've seen today and it is important that when you do a test as we've been describing today that actually that's only a snapshot on one day and thereby hangs the point that essentially as and when you change products and or you uh, go out in different windy conditions or uh, spreading conditions, thanks to the terrain, the slip on the tractors and so on, you may find that the results don't match your expectations. And we need to try and improve our performance yield wise and economically and environmentally. And thereby hangs the point that essentially the best way to do that will be, I hope to, do the job properly and, and that's you know what we're all paid to do is be competent and professional so hopefully um, people will uh, welcome any opportunity for as it were taking the uh, training and or testing and then if and when there was a test for operators then it would be a bit like the sprayer operator of the year it drives hopefully um people to, as it were, look at this area because it is something that actually matters. Good. Thank you, Nigel. Um, a good answer. And yeah, like you say, being here today is, is a good step in that right direction, isn't it? So brilliant. Um, some more some more good questions um, here for you. Uh, Trevor, do you want to go for this one? Um, when carrying out the trade test, why didn't you do a return pass um, to account for kind of possible variable win? Um, you know, if you're only passing once, do you, you know, fill the tubes and it's a bit artificial with what you're doing? It's, it's a good question. Um, for the that's, that's a very good question. Uh, but the ideal situation is we don't go spreading with a crosswind anyhow. 
So, but I know that that's not realistic. Uh, it, it's part of the NSTS test where we've set it up so we do the one pass. It is down to a timing issue as well. Uh, it also depends on the pattern, uh, the the pattern of the the spread of the machine on whether you need to do the one pass or. Um, I don't disagree that probably doing more than one pass would probably give you a good result, but sometimes we're limited on the area where we're actually carrying out this test uh, and related to the product. We may find if we have to do a second run because of restrictions, we have to lift all them trays up again and move to another place to do that second run. So, but Ian, do you just want to comment on that? Because we have talked about this before, haven't we? Yeah, I think you've covered it fairly well, but because of the way that we transfer the product from the trays into the test tubes, we are mirroring quite accurately, I feel, that the way that the product is spread in a real situation. And because of that overlap on the second pass, if we use that overlap and transfer it into the tubes moving back towards the center of the spreader uh, reflects that second pass and again i think yeah, it's it's the quantity of product and the the risk of um applying too much product in the same area um there may be excessive time that the the, the, the test would take yeah yeah, so it's that balancing, isn't it, of the, the practical and, and getting it as right as you can. Um, no, that's good. Um, so a good question here from Jim for you, Trevor. Um, if your spreader is spreading too wide, what's the best way to reduce it? Is it PTO speed or adjusting the veins or what would be um, the best way to do that? Well, again, I'd go back, first of all, to the manufacturer's book and check that you have got the right discs, the right veins in and the right settings in the machine. And as I was trying to state, state before, in some cases, the PTO speed may directly affect your uh, disc speed, but in other cases, like in hydraulic drives and that, well, then the PTO speed perhaps don't come into the equation. So uh, how do I reduce that? That could be the, the you've got the incorrect angle, you've got the height is wrong, which that's quite a common one for spreading too wide. And, uh, well, that's, that's really the main, main reasons, I suppose. If you've got the tilt wrong, the height wrong and the speed of the discs and the incorrect discs on there all could have the effect on the width of spread. Good, thank you. Um, a few things to check there for you, Jim, um, to look at that. Um, a question from Stuart for you, Ian. Um, you said that kind of spreaders with way cells self-calibrate, if you like. Um, do the way cells themselves need calibrating and is this done on an NTS, an STS test? Um, the the way cells aren't calibrated during the test um the really the same with um when we're doing sprayer testing or pesticide application testing we aren't actually calibrating the machine itself really that is the down to the uh, the operator to ensure that the calibration is correct and uh, where where the machines have way cells and, and and in my experience you you can check this as you put the bags in the fertilizer spreader because the screen usually tells you the weight of what's been added to the spreader and i think uh, knowing the krm slightly that you you can set the way cells to zero before you fill them up uh, and keep an eye on the what's been put in the spreader and how much the the, the figure is reading on the screen. Can, can I just come in on that one as well, Teresa? Uh, being a bit old fashioned and back to basics, when you come to calibrating, I'm still a great believer that one of the best forms of just double checking the calibration on that machine is you know the size of that field. If you know how much product you put in, you can do that on a continuous basis during the day and just have an idea on how much you're using over that particular area. So you can subconsciously check the way cells and all the sensors knowing that you should have used the, that amount of product over that certain area. Is that a yeah. fair comment? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I do. I love to hear. You said the other day, didn't you? If you're going out and putting on an X kilos a hectare, it could go on all in the same spot. So I guess there's, you know, there's the two ways of looking at it. But yeah, no, definitely, that's the that's practical way of doing it, isn't it? Um, it's a good question here from Graham. I'll ask you this one, Ian. When weighing a litre of product, do you bang the tube to get as much in as possible? That's quite a good, good question. <laughs> no, we, the, 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 the litre cylinder is filled with product and levelled off just with a sweep of the hand and, and that would be the litre weight that we measure. No, that's great. Um, and similarly, um, David's got a question, the same, similar, but on the spreader. Um, Trevor, how full should the spreaders be to carry out a test? Well, you want enough so that the, the discs are well primed and uh, you don't want to be going over the tray and slightly running out. So, you know, I'm not saying you need to put a ton in there by no means, but and that depends then how many passes we're going to do also. So you want enough to go over probably the cone over top of that uh, uh, agitate that's in there so that you've got plenty, enough product to travel that distance over the tries. Brilliant. Um, uh, uh, can I add in there also, yeah. Teresa, it, it's certainly a good consideration for the operator when he's working. And this may sound fairly obvious, but depending on how much fertilizer is in the spreader, may affect the actual height that the machine is running at so if you can imagine with a full spreader it may drop the the, the, the spreader down a bit but as it empties it, it may rise up as um as it becomes more empty yeah no it's a good point isn't it it's all those kind of practical yeah. things you're trying to make your your calibration yeah. your k test as accurate as it is to when you're actually going out you know putting on the product so no thank you ian sorry nigel um trevor and ian have got the bulk of them here you happy i'm just gonna keep firing them at them um so it's a question i'm going to ask you this one trevor um do you have any advice on setting on and off um on shutting on and off with a section control any advice on section on control? Set setting the shutting on and off um when you're using section control how you'd set it up? Oh, well, it's a bit like on the sprayer. I mean, the more sections you can switch off, in theory, the more accurate you're going to apply the product, especially on your, your short work, your scoots or whatever the wording is in other parts of the country. Uh, it's really back down to the, No, I haven't got any real advice down to that because I think a lot of that, of that is down to individual situations, the size of your fields and the... Uh, technology that you perhaps got on the equipment at, at that moment in time. Uh, I struggle to get my head round slightly when we talk about sectional cont controls on a spreader. Now on a sprayer I can understand that, we have a boom out there, we shut the outer section off and uh, there's nothing to go over that area. If we shut a section off, an inner section off, for like, sake on a spreader, I can't see how you can get granules out to a point going over an area without some dropping on that point. So is it true sectional control? I haven't been persuaded about that, but it's certainly, it's certainly an advantage to give us a more accurate application and distribution of the product. So I don't know if that's answered that very well or not, but. No, I think it's good and it's technologies developing all the time, isn't it? You know, with it and yeah, trust me. Yeah, what I would say is that I, I do, and I might be out of order saying this, but I do sometimes think we are pushing the ring the rings of trying to spread these products too far. And I you can't get away from the fact that if you had a boom and you had placement, it's going to be a lot more accurate than actually trying to throw a product where you've got the, the ballistics, the, you've got the wind that'll affect the, the size of the product, you've got the shape of the product, you've got the surface of the product. And there's so many variables that can happen on the day, isn't there, that can affect how effectively you're gonna throw these products off yeah. a spinning disc, doing 700 RPM. Um, and it's, uh, uh, if I can add in there, Teresa, I remember one of Ian Richards slides in the first meeting and he showed that over maybe the last 30 or so years how spread widths have 
increased on fertilizer spreaders um and but i think that the the help there is that products have dramatically improved so their their spread characteristics are a lot better and also as trevor's just said the the technology on equipment is, is far far superior to what we saw 30 years ago uh, there there may be a limit to how far we can spread these products but um they, they are far better than they were in the past no definitely we're moving in the right direction aren't we as as with everything no it's good um so we've got a couple of questions about um would you tray test for every product and you know if you're setting your machine up once at the beginning of the year can you hope that then it works through the season or what's your kind of thought on the balance of that and and getting the product on in the in the field uh well, I would certainly recommend that every product is tested that you have and test them every year. And as we've said, the variability of, of the products, even if it's the same brand, etc., cetera, if it, from one year to the next, you certainly can see variations. Um, but depending on how many products you, you want to test, I would certainly focus on any fertilizers containing nitrogen and the importance there is to make sure you're abiding by the the, the rules within nvz's yeah no absolutely and thank you and um, we've got some good comments I'm just scrolling down to the bottom of my questions here and um, just kind of andrew's saying trevor an issue that varies um, with auto on and off with gps auto systems and it varies with different products as well so you know there's there is that kind of variation as well and robert's saying as well for anyone that doesn't have a machine with way cells is it worth uh, mentioning that air temperature and moisture can affect the flow rate of prilled products on warm afternoons you'll apply more than on a cool morning do you see that trevor um as yeah well? I, I totally agree with that yeah as the conditions yeah. in the atmosphere change and early morning when there's heavy dews and such like yeah I, I totally go along with those comments and that's what we keep trying to say that you know we've done this process test to die at this particular time in these particular conditions you get out in the field in a couple of hours time and a lot of that could have changed so uh, we're doing what we can to get it as accurate as possible but we can't account for changes that are happening on a constant basis can we uh, no. as, and, the, and the biggest problem i will just say is nsts testers of spreaders and i think if there's any other spreader testers out there listening with us they'll agree with me our biggest problem with testers is the time of the year when you want your spreaders tested which is pretty much now and as a typical example you know we had tests booked in all this week but we're having to cancel them because that's that time of the year when we got the rain so try and get your test done as soon as possible uh so you don't get into a backlog of uh, uh, a program of well not physically be able to get them done before you actually go to use your spreader well i'd like to do them before christmas to be honest with you but you probably haven't got the product on the farm and then perhaps when the machines be installed something might go wrong and we don't take that into account when you do actually come to spread it so it's the real balance isn't it and yeah that kind of the timing's everything but yeah there's only so many hours in the day for you trevor i'm sure running around um norfolk so yeah. A couple more questions. Add, sorry. Go on, Ian. Yep. Yeah, I'd like to add, yeah, just going back to the question regarding the effects of um, certainly humidity in a product. Uh, one of the factors here is ensuring that you buy a, a good quality product in the first place. And one of the important factors there is the uniformity of the product itself in this um in the size of the granules. And I mentioned that the product that we used the uniformity was very good but certainly if you get a lot of fines so the really small almost dust in a product one that if it is damp that's something that is really going to stick to the machine and affect the spread pattern whilst you're working but another issue is if it's dry and it's a little bit windy this the fines can act as like um spray drift and and float off it, uh, across the field and potentially further risks in getting into into water courses 
Yeah, and that's really valuable, um, Ian, isn't it? There's, yeah, so many things to consider um, on it. Um, on the wind question, we've got a couple of questions here from another Trevor, Trevor and Charles, um, asking about, you know, how much will wind affect spreading at, at a speed? If Is it similar to, you know, normal spraying or what's, could you comment on the wind effect? Uh, hi, Trevor, Trevor. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think the wind is going to affect the spread pattern as much as it do with a droplet. At the end of the day, a, a droplet on a sprayer is more prone to being affected by the wind because we're now talking about a pellet or a, a prill. Uh, but yes, the answer is wind will affect it. And the biggest problem we always have, and we have this as well as testers, when we lay the trays out, Ian rightly said, ideally, we've got a back wind. We don't want to do a te tray test with a crosswind. But when we get to the farm, very often, we have to abide by the tram lines that are in the field. So again, we have to try and take that into account that we can only lay the trays out, you know, uh, 90 degrees to the, to, the, to the tram lines. So yes, crosswind is not ideal. Yes, it will affect it. Uh, me being a shooting man, when Ian talks about ballistics and that, and I don't know if I'm right in referring it back to this, but you know, the projection projectile of the lead in a shotgun cartridge, to get that to adjust on how far it go, it's very much down to the angle that you hold the gun. And I do believe that one of the biggest effects on spread width is perhaps the angle. So if they mention, like in our case, that was plus two degrees, I think that does have quite an adverse effect on your spread, spread width. So... Going back to the wind bit, yes, it will have uh, uh, some effect, but the, it's go back to that old equation, don't it, regarding like slug pellets. When do we go slug pelleting? We go slug pelleting when that's too windy to go spraying. No, if that's not good enough to go spraying, you shouldn't be out there slug pelleting. And if you've got that much wind, you perhaps shouldn't be out there with your fertiliser spreader if that's going to, especially around waterways and headlands. Is that a fair comment? <laughs> Yeah, I think Nigel will nod and agree with that. <laughs> yeah. In that um, there is a statistic for those who are using 30 spreaders as slug pellet applicators that one pellet in a one meter wide water course will contaminate 33 kilometers above the legal limit for pesticides. And thereby hangs the point that you've got to have a no spread zone, but even worse, these um, 30 spreaders are often more accurate than an ATV spreader, which often lacks calibration. So apologies for the noise. Um, but um, yeah, so on that basis, we do have uh, challenges. Yeah, and I think the importance of doing what we're doing and, you know, taking all that into consideration is there. You know, we've got well, well experienced operators on the call that, you know, uh, are being conscious of all of those um, when they're doing so. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. It's the impact is is big there. Um, Ian, I'm going to ask you this question. How do you test and calibrate for a blended fertiliser? Well, it would be the same as... Uh, testing any other product uh, maybe the, the 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 change is when you're doing the hardness tests on the product and again you want to take a representative sample of all of the products so a section of a selection of both or all of the different types within that blend um, you you would again try and get that representative sample when when testing the product Good. Um, thank you, Ian. Um, uh, what well, I'm going to ask you next, I'm going to ask you Stuart's question next. Um, one for you, Trevor, maybe. Spreaders mounted on self-propelled machines are often uh, mounted higher than the manufacturers recommend. Is this a problem? Is it a problem? It's only going to be a problem if the height is such that you cannot get the right spread width that you want you might be too high and your spread width is going to go beyond what you're actually after so and that's like with a boom sprayer as well uh, the higher those discs are and the higher you start to project that uh, product 
the more effect the wind is going to have on it as well. So uh, it's got it's down to an individual situation. If you're getting the width that you want from that machine being mounted that high, and you're getting a good spread pattern, just bear in mind that the wind may affect your product more than someone else who's got a machine that's lower down. Does that make sense, Sam? You're happy with that? Yeah, but also I think if, if you're buying a new fertilizer spreader, you would want to ensure um, from the manufacturer that if, if you are using that setup to ensure that they they have some recommendations of, of how the machine would be set up compared to what the normal height might be on the on the back of a tractor because obviously there's generally no way you're going to get it um, as low down on the back of a tractor there will be some maybe completely different settings that the that the equipment would need to be set up to start with Brilliant. Um, thank you. I've got a technical question here, Ian. I'm going to go for you for this one, but Trevor, feel free to pop in um, from Alan. Are you aware of the GSI, so the Granular Metric Spread Index, and um, which a certain fertilizer manufacturer supplies, and how useful is it? Um, is that something that either of you have come across and find it useful? I don't have any information uh, regarding GSI. That's um... That, that sounds an interesting point to look to, but I don't have any experience with it, no. Okay, no, that's lovely. Um, so I've got a few. Um, there's quite an interesting question here. Um, Joe's kind of picking up on the variable rate and um, points that you're making, Trevor, and saying, can the accuracy of variable rate control be tested effectively? Um, that's that's a very good question. That one, isn't it? Uh, how do we test for variable rate control? Help me out here, Ian, because I'm just trying well, to. It, it, again, it's going back to um, calibration and setting up the machine correctly when you're working in the field. Um, it would be something that's possibly very difficult to test um, at, at the time of, of testing. Um, but it's just trying to stress that we aren't doing a physical calibration on the spreader and for variable rate, I think it's an in-field operation at the time of, of doing an application uh, is, is how I would answer that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm just going back to like on a sprayer, if we wanted to know if a variable rate controller was working on that, we could actually look at the flow meter readings. And I'm, I'm just trying to think whether there's any of the uh, manufacturers within their uh, box of tricks in the tractor cab actually gives you a continuous flow reading of the product. So if you actually saw that flow reading uh, varying, that would give you a good indication maybe that variable rate controlling was working but i would have to look into that perhaps someone else could tell us the answer on that one yeah if anybody can feel free to put the answer in the questions box and we'll share it um yeah that's what we're here to do today um right i've got um, last few minutes i'm going to ask you a last couple of questions here we're doing well up. you're doing brilliantly guys um, keep going there's a lot of questions here but i think we're nearly there with asking them there's some quite specific ones and i think for those of you that have asked quite specific ones i might just get ian and trevor to answer those and, and send them back to you um it's a good one from here um yeah from andrew he kind of says when you're spraying pesticides there's a recommended forward speed in order to achieve the best application of the product is there a recommended forward speed for the best application of fertilizers it's something we haven't covered yet um I think. do you want me to start, answer that one in from a practical you, point of view yeah, start you can do Trevor. Yeah. yeah well forward speed what determines forward speed number one can i keep in the seat of the tractor Number two, can I keep in the tram lines or the roll crop work that I'm doing? And as with spryers, they tell us that uh, uh, 12 kilometers an hour is probably the ideal speed to go at because once you start going above that, the wind will increase the drift. And I would say a similar thing would apply to when you're actually using a fertilizer spreader as well. 
comments Ian? Yeah, uh, I'm not aware of any recommended speeds for application of fertilizer. I think you mentioned earlier, Trevor, you, you know, with the with the weight of a fertilizer prill or granule compared to a, a liquid spray, it's likely to be less prone to drift. So potentially speeds could be increased, but I I can't recommend anything because, as I say, I'm not entirely sure whether any work has been done on the effects of speed uh, and spreading uh, capacity. Okay, thanks very much both. Um, Mr. Strawson's kindly come back and said, when you're doing variable rate, the aperture settings change when you go from the high to the low rate parts of the field, um, which is uh, it, it's just the kind of this pattern, isn't it, that we're testing. Um, Trevor, how do you know how far out of the back um, the spreader is throwing, i.e. when you start to work, how long do you want to wait before turning on and vice versa when you're ending the work? I think that's a really important question from David and yeah, Nigel will like the answer for that one as well. I think that's you know often what we need to be thinking about, isn't yeah. it? Is that something that you look at when you're doing um, the testing? What, what I've actually found is the uh... The point, if you notice, I think on that picture, you can see a stick in front of the tractor, can you? Yep. That's there to give us a guide on when we actually switch the spreader off after we've gone through the tries. And the minimum we're probably looking at is if we're spreading at 36 metre, that distance there probably wants to be a minimum of 18 metre because that's thrown out in like a, an arc pattern. And as far as how soon do you start on, well, my argument would be you want to make certain you've started early enough uh, so the discs are fully loaded or fully primed and there's a full pattern coming out before you go over the tray. So I would tend to pretty much start the same distance before the trays as well. Ian, what does the NSTS say? I think that do give yeah, us time. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've covered it. I mean, generally, th there may be some variations within product, but in general i would take the rule of thumb of um, if it spreads 36 meters it's going to spread somewhere in the region of 18 meters behind so in a field situation you have to consider a certain amount of overlap from your headland pass and setting up the machine accordingly and and, and understanding when you you know when to turn on and off going in and out of work Good. Um, thank you both. Um, right. I mean, nearly, well, I think we're probably about there. there was, um, David's made a very good point here. We haven't really mentioned tyre pressures. Um, you know, yeah, Trevor, anything to mention on tyre pressures? Yeah, you're, you're at, he's absolutely right. That is something else that we need to check. Uh, again, uh, you need to have that machine level uh, left and right. And just down to things like i have come across one where before where someone had a brand new tire on one side and a well worn out tire on the other and just that extra three or four inches of cleat on the tire was enough just to cock the machine up and upset the pattern so yes tire pressures are right tire pressures are dependent on what's best for you and what tires you got on there but they need to be even perhaps that's the best way to say the tire pressure should be even yeah that's a very very good point yeah another point and also, might... it, it, sorry nigel do you want to go ahead i was just going to say you might want to consider that actually if you can have tire pressures relatively low in field work then you will get less bounce on your tram lines which may help your forward speed but by the same token you need wide enough tram lines etc but the point about tire pressures being even on both sides is absolutely critical yeah yeah. And if I could add, if it go going back to my point about the the height that the spreader is set at, that with with low low pressure in in your tyres, that drop when the machine is fully loaded is obviously going to continually change as the as the machine empties, and you you need to consider. Um, that the machine is working at the correct height all the way through the, each tank load that you are spreading. And that might also raise the point about depth of the tram lines, because some tram lines are deeper than others in certain parts of the field, etc. So there's a whole range of variables here. That's another big problem when we 
set the tries out. If we go and set them tries out, whereupon there's a lump just as the tyres go through the tries, that could have an adverse effect on, on the uh, actual uh, uh, pattern as well. And another problem we have is, OK, this was on a grass meadow that was a bit lumpy, but very often we're asked to go into a crop where maybe the crop is four, five, six inches tall, and it's always a job to try and get them tries nice and level and flat. So uh, a nice flat bowling green, if that could be provided, would be ideal for us. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Diana's echoing that. She's like, and the ground and the soil conditions and all these things to kind of think about, isn't it? So, yeah, and um, not easy. And um, Richard has, you know, said to you, thank you for the, you know, for such an interesting presentation and the Q&A has been especially interesting. And I think, yeah, massive thank you, Trevor and Ian and, and to Nigel for your input as well, because I think we've covered a lot in that question and answer session and there's a lot of valuable um, points there. So, just to wrap up then um, our session this morning, um, I'm just going to put yeah plug for basis and Neroso points again. Um, we've been working hard to to register those for you in the background. If anybody hasn't yet put their details in, if you want to pop them in the questions box now, your uh, membership number and your postcode, and we need your date of birth as well for your Neroso one. Um, we'll make sure we register those for you. Um, if you're watching this back on the recording, um, please feel free to email um, ke.events at ahdb.org.uk or drop me um, an email as well if you've got any questions. And like I say, we, we have got, we've done really well with the questions, Trevor and Ian, um, but there are a few in here that would be good to do. So I'll pick up on those and come back to those of you that were the specific questions. So just to wrap up um, this morning and our final couple of minutes, um, with some further information, um, Christian, if we can move on. So there's just a few um, things that might be of interest for you. If you're planning on going out and putting your fertilizer on, um, just kind of don't forget that there's the nutrient management planning that needs to kind of happen first. Um, the important part alongside um, doing your calibration, your trade testing, the nutrient management guide is available on our AHDB website. Um, section one, section two are the principles and then the different sections there are available for you. Um, you can download it, you can get the app or you can order a hard copy as well. Um, we're just about literally um, today, tomorrow, I think this week to launch our excess winter rainfall information as well. Um, given the year that we've had this year, that will be important. Um, and we've also got the fertiliser prices that are available and come out um, on a regular basis. So just feel free to use that information um, that's available to you all there as well. Nigel, do you want to say a couple of words about the catchment sensitive farming advice that's available around the country? Yes, thank you, Teresa. We work as catchment sensitive farming in what's called high water priority areas at the moment. Um, there are across England uh, something like a hundred catchment sensitive farming officers who help people with best practice in relation to water quality, uh, air quality and potentially um, natural flood management and even maybe water resources in some places. And we're trying to keep our water clean from both fertilizers in terms of nitrate and phosphate but also pesticides, sediment and potentially faecal indicators and so on. So hopefully we can work with you uh, because we don't have a blueprint. We actually work with you to make adjustments where that's appropriate. And we have, offer a wide range of visits and grants to help you with that process of improving what you want to improve. And so if you would like to get in touch, then please use the handout to find the most appropriate person to contact. And the other thing I wanted to quickly say was City and Guilds do a level two course on uh, fertilizer spreader testing for anyone who isn't up for the examiner's course, by the way. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. And um, the list of all the catchment sensitive farming um, contact details and all the offers that are there, that's in that handout section. So just above where you're typing in your basis and Roso points and your questions, um, that's there for you to download. So I think that brings us to the end um, neatly. I think a huge thank you um, to Trevor and to Ian. Ian and Trevor have put a huge amount of work into bringing today together um, to bring the videos, which really does bring it to life, Trevor and Ian. Um, and a huge thank you to you for being practical about what we're doing, um, for looking at it and for answering the questions. And many thanks to all of you that have asked the questions and you know, found asking the things that are appropriate to you because it helps us all. 
So the session has been recorded today and I think it'd be a very valuable, useful um, resource for the future. Um, thank you. Thank you to working with you as well, um, Nigel, in terms of caption sensitive farming. Um, this is something that we did put on um, this year as, as something a bit different with caption sensitive farming. You're going to have a survey that you'll um, get as you go out um, leave today virtually. If you do just get, take a minute to fill that in, and we do find that really useful, and we use that to kind of look at what we can do in the future. Um, Nigel, we've already been discussing whether there's a role for doing a similar thing for um, manure spreader testing for slug pellet applicators. Um, I had a call this morning, is today going to cover liquid? We haven't discussed liquid today. So if there's other things that you think would be useful to run in this kind of format, um, please use that survey to do it. Or as always, um, get in touch with me if you've got any other questions or want information, we can help as AHDB or indeed point you in the right direction to Ian or Trevor or Nigel or our colleagues, and um, please let us know. So a big thank you for joining us. Um, good luck with your fertilizer, for your fertilizer on this season. Do go and put into practice all of what you've heard today. Um, the slides and the recording will be available if you want to go back and look at those details. I hope it dries out for you and then we don't get, it doesn't not rain again um, until the summer. So best of luck to you all. And yeah, good luck for the season ahead. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye.